Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Spring is here and Hoosiers across the state are ready to enjoy the season. And nothing gives you a new perspective like a change in the weather. Join Jessica Nunemaker as she ventures to Batesville, Indiana. Enter the magical menagerie of Bob Woolinen and his furry creations. Climb the world's highest peaks with Columbus's Walter Glover. And enjoy the soulful sounds of the Halpern Blues Band featuring powerhouse Lauren Robert. A new world is blossoming outside. Stay right here for the stories you'll only find on the weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special. I'm Erica Sagone. And I'm Daryl Neer. Now, Erica, spring is here. Is there anything in particular you like to do out in the nice weather? Well, when it gets, you know, warmer outside, as much as I love to go out into nature, what I really love is bopping around all of the cool downtowns in Indiana. I mean, it's just nice to be able to go in and out of stores and restaurants without freezing. Wandering without pressure. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're looking for great opportunities to explore the state during the spring season, Jessica Nunemaker is here to introduce you to a fantastic new location. And this is only a small sample of the neat things to do around Batesville, Indiana. Let's take a closer look at what this great Indiana town has to offer. Batesville, Indiana is one of those small towns that you have to see to believe. There's Ertel Cellars Winery and Lil Charlie's Brewery. Oh, and wood carving, a toy store, and over 40,000 square feet of boutique shopping. Yes, 40,000 square feet. You can't miss Ron Weber Marketplace. This was our first introduction to Batesville and it made a lasting impression. Ron Weber Marketplace is a shopping extravaganza. It is full of vendors with items that range from books, furniture and ceramics to glass, military surplus and more. In other words, you'll want to leave yourself plenty of time to browse. Turn the kids loose in the arcade. Most games are only a quarter. Unpack your bags at Sherman House Inn. You can stay where your grandma or great-grandma could have stayed. It began as a coaching tavern back in 1852. Right in downtown Batesville, it doesn't get more convenient than that. The rooms are so unique, and with its German-themed restaurant, it's kind of fun. You'll feel like a kid in a toy store when you venture out across the street from Sherman House and into Christian's Kinderladen for one very good reason. It is a toy store. I've never seen so much fun packed into one building. All the name brands you know are here, and playing with toys is encouraged, if not irresistible. We aren't done yet. There's more to see and do around the downtown area, but when you're done exploring, you'll want to head up the road to Weberdeen's wood carving. Since 1924, Weberdeen's has been the place to go for Hoosier craftsmanship. With a 22,000 square foot workshop, it's amazing to watch wood carving in action. With both a winery and a brewery, you've got decisions to make when it comes down to where you'll spend your evening. They are both wonderful, so really, you'll have to flip a coin to decide. Or choose to stay an extra night. Shopping, attractions, and more. Look at all the fun you've been missing right in your own backyard. This is Little Indiana. Read more at www.littleindiana.com. Small towns, destinations, not drive throughs Well, thanks, Jessica. Yep, she always has the best ideas for small towns across the state. So, Daryl, when you visit a small town, is there something that you gravitate toward or that you're really looking for? Absolutely. I think you can learn a lot about the character of a town by going to the restaurants, the bars, the coffee shops. I don't think there's anything better. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Well, our next subject, artist Bob Woolinen, proves that there are unexpected finds all across Indiana and the world. People, when they put a puppet on their hand, 
say the craziest things, it, it transforms people. And actually, that's kind of phenomenal. I'm Bob Wallinen, and I'm a character designer. There, there was an attitude my brother David had that rubbed off on me. And that was uh, a lot of times, oh, you can't find it? Well, we'll just make it. A, a lot of my creativity of creating characters came from monsters initially, to create monsters. That, that's where the seed started. You know, I'm going to create my own Wolfman. I'm going to create my own version of Frankenstein. To me, it's great to be able to create something that people have emotional ties to and can react to that, that you've created, that you've pulled together from scratch or from your own imagination. I like to inspire thought. I like to make people think. I, I think too many people go through life without thinking. And I think that's the part art has to play. You look at it, pause and reflect. And if you don't do that, then essentially you've not made an impact with what you've created. Maybe that's kind of an unusual way to look at things, but um, it sure fires my imagination. Because when I'm working on a puppet, it's kind of fun. I'm in a mirror. I have to look at it and understand what's going on with it and its reaction as I move it and the character I impart to it. So you get this frame of mind while you're doing that. And then somebody else takes it. And then the expression's different. The way the character moves is different. Even the voice. Sometimes they'll impart a perfect voice for this puppet, one that I couldn't even imagine. And it, it quite literally completely changes the character. It's the heart that's within the actual puppet, its movement, its voice, its, its character, all the little nuances that make us as individuals different are imparted into these puppets. And it just, it's just amazing. The, the joy I receive from it is through the thoughts of the smiles of people and, and, and their face. And, and when people pick up a puppet and they put it on their hand and they move it, you can see this, they're transformed. They're trans, they've changed their personality, they've changed their character and injected it into this silly little thing on their hand, creating a whole new entity that's beside themselves. And, and actually, that's kind of phenomenal. It's good to exercise your emotional and creative freedom as an individual, and I've created a tool that allows you to do that. I'm sparking emotions. I'm sparking parts of people's personalities that they probably would never tap, that they would never touch, and that's magical. And there's so much in the world that's magic to me, and to me, that's fabulous magic. To see more examples of Bob's incredible furry creations, visit his website, bobsimaginaryfriends.com. I just love those puppets, and I love the peek into Bob's imagination. Well, I love the origins come out of the monsters that he followed when he was younger. I think they're absolutely fabulous. And I'm, I'm curious, what would we look like if we were Bob's puppets? Bob, if you're out there, what do you think? You want to take us on? <laughs> Well, for the last decade, Columbus resident Walter Glover has raised money for children by summiting the world's tallest mountains. In May, Walter will celebrate the 10th anniversary of his Mount Everest climb. To celebrate, he is readying himself for a new challenge. Retired pastoral care chaplain Walter Glover understands the importance of actively maintaining his health. Spurred by his love of wellness, he turned his attention toward combating youth obesity he never imagined his efforts to change his community would bring him across the world. My beloved Aunt Angie, who helped raise me and was also my godmother, as a child, she was obese. And she was just very vigilant that that would never happen again. And she never wanted that to be an issue. That was imprinted on me at a very young age. This idea of wellness. For a couple of years I've been fascinated by the elite men and women that are climbing the mountain. I mean, that started all this. Fast forward 12 months later, it's 06. It's the climbing season at Everest. Base camp was my adventure. I had the dream of the mountain, 
but I hadn't made the connection to fundraising at that point. Again, I think that was one of those grace moments, gifts, when I knew that I would be going to Kilimanjaro, and I knew that there were seven summits, and I'm kind of thinking, is this something I can do? And it was a chance to raise money for a cause, like mountains, it just grew and grew. <laughs> To date, Glover has raised over $100,000, summiting five of the seven infamous peaks. Glover covers the entire cost of his trips, asking his supporters to pledge a dollar amount for every foot he climbs. All of the money raised goes to bringing Life for Kids, a holistic youth obesity program, to St. Vincent Hospitals in the area. Kids learn how to eat correctly. Kids learn the importance and how to exercise correctly. There are behavioral therapists that help them understand how to implement these changes in their life. They have an Aunt Angie, someone that cares about them and not just give them information, but give them formation techniques to make it happen. Last year, however, Glover's efforts took a dramatic change of course. While training for Mount McKinley, he suffered a brutal fall. Though the fall resulted in only a few broken ribs, doctors made an unexpected discovery. Four aneurysms, resulting in open heart surgery. Glover's spirit remained undeterred. Dr. Hymanson, my cardiovascular surgeon, said, do you have any questions? I said, I only got one. He said, what's that? I said, when can I return to the mountains? And we agreed on a date. And I said, here's your assignment. When I get out of here, I want to be even stronger than I was when I came in here. Less than a year later, he returned to the slopes, summiting Mount Rainier this summer. It's important not to rest on your laurels. If 15 years ago, somebody would have knocked on my door and said, here's what your life is gonna look like. You're gonna get a master's in theology, you're gonna provide pastoral care, and oh, by the way, you're gonna try and climb the seven summits. I would have said to that person, you know, I'm sure you're right but you're knocking on the wrong door. You need to go down the hallway. It isn't so much about the destination, it's about the journey. When you're on the summit, we don't learn from the summit. We learn when we climb to the summit. To follow Walter's latest adventures, visit his website, twotrekforkids.org. Walter's upcoming climb will raise money toward the Foundation for Youth. Learn more about the organization at foundationforyouth.com. Now, Erica, Walter is going to trek 17,000 feet as he climbs Rainbow Mountain, part of the Andes in Peru. Just incredible. And you know, Walter has raised over $130,000 so far to build three youth obesity prevention and treatment programs at St. Vincent Ministries throughout Southern Indiana. Really amazing. So if you're looking for an outdoor adventure a little closer to home, there are wonderful hidden gems right here in Indiana. The old growth forests of Hemmer Woods Nature Preserve are a remnant of the vast woodlands that once covered southwestern Indiana. Located in eastern Gibson County, the 73-acre preserve hosts both upland oak hickory forest and bottomland mixed hardwoods. Fewer than 2,000 acres of virgin forests remain intact in Indiana, a far cry from the state's original 20 million forested acres. As such, the old growth forests of Hemmer Woods are especially rare, earning the designation as a national natural landmark. Hemmer Woods lies within the Wabash lowlands that extend across southwestern Indiana. Although the glaciers of the last ice age did not reach this far south, their meltwaters had a major impact on this corner of the state. Located a few miles to the north, the glaciers sent torrents of water through the area at the end of the last ice age, carving a low spot in the landscape that extends to the present-day Wabash River. Bottomland Forest covers the lowest elevations of Hemmer Woods, but unlike similar forest types elsewhere in the region, 
the forest floor is rarely flooded. As a result, bottomland species here include vegetation that does not have a high tolerance for flooding. The bottomland woods host many southern plant species growing at the far northern end of their range, most notably sweet gum and tulip trees. The two largest tulip trees in the state grow here, measuring more than 150 feet tall, but just five feet in diameter. Other common trees in the bottomlands include river birch, sycamore, wild black cherry, and various oak species. Hemmer Woods' much larger upland forest grows on slightly elevated land with mesic soils. White oak and black oak are the dominant tree species. Other common species include white ash, red oak, sassafras, pignut, small-fruited hickory, and shagbark hickory. Hemmer Woods continues to be open and free to the public for a chance to step back in time and experience Indiana's forests as they once were, before settlers, before statehood, and before the wooded sacrifice to the growth of industry. To find directions to Hemmer Woods or to learn about other great nature preserves across the state, visit in.gov slash DNR. Well, now I officially have the itch to get out and explore nature. So, Daryl, do you have any favorite hiking spots or outdoor places to explore in Indiana that you can tell us about? Yeah, Erica, I, I really love any of the Sycamore Land Trust sites. Mm -hmm. I think they're amazing. And I'm not a cyclist, but I love to bike out in the Hoosier National Forest. I think there's, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, for me, it's any place with water, a little lake, a little <laughs> waterfall. <laughs> well, we are excited to welcome our next musical guest. Born in Israel, Rami Halperin brings a unique perspective to an American tradition. Meet the Halperin Blues Band. I've always loved music, but when I was 15, I had a friend back in Israel that kind of introduced me to Led Zeppelin and The Doors, but I really had a knack for playing the instrument. So I developed an obsession because I wanted to know if I already have a knack, where can I go with it as far as the level of playing? Because it seemed to me like an amazing way to express yourself. The role that a guitar teacher plays in a person's life is meaningful. When I was 16, 17, I had a wonderful guitar teacher in Israel, and not only I learned a lot about the instrument, but he was the first grown-up that acknowledged my talent, and he gave me the drive. I lived my first 33, 34 years in Israel. I moved to America with my wife and son in 2011. I got into the famous King of the Blues competition, which Guitar Center held, and I ended up in the national finals. That was a little bit of an eye-opener for me. I asked myself, what does it mean that I come to the States and there's something about my playing that resonates with people? I said, maybe I should pursue being more in the front as well. The core band is Jamie Reed, who's our drummer. He's an amazing drummer, so we immediately clicked. After that, we got Ron Kadish, the bass player. With this band, what I'm trying to do is walk the line of really being a blues band, but also pushing the envelope a little bit. It manifests itself in having a high level of expression and a kind of a deep intensity. We try to bring it from a very, very deep, authentic place. How do I go about writing new tunes? For me, it's usually the same kind of process. I play the guitar, I improvise, and I stumble on something that I never played before. So once I stumbled on something, it could be like a simple lick or a chord progression, I just focus on that, and I turn this seed of idea to a full song. Ideally, I would like to play for everyone. If someone who's not a guitar player can relate to your playing, that means you're playing in a really melodic, soulful way. I think the biggest challenge as a musician is to letting go of the need for approval. Some may say that it's not a very easy way to make a living. For me, it's not necessarily about that. I think I just have to do it. It's just your breathing. It's so much part of who I am. It's the way I express myself. It's a very deep connection. You can be real. The guitar doesn't judge you. And also playing the guitar is a form of meditation because when you play it, 
you're not in your mind. It's a great gift to have something like that in your life. I often tell people, in America, without the guitar, I'm just a guy with a funny accent, you know? <laughs> so, I definitely should stick with the guitar. Well, the things that I would like to see with the Halper and Blues Band, doing well inside of the blues genre, pursue gigs that can put us in front of audiences that are into blues, whether it's festivals or going to more of a theater level. But most of all, I want to be able to play shows where people listen to the music. And now, the Halper and Blues Band featuring special guest vocalist Lauren Robert. Well, I want you to say That the blues is back And it's here to stay For more information on Halperin Blues Band music releases and upcoming shows, visit their website, halperinblues.com. Well, that's all the time that we've got for tonight, but one more time before we go, the Halperin Blues Band. Good night.
Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 